Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Success Life Live and the Fun Friend Friday edition. You know I love saying that, the Fun Friend Friday. So uh, I will bring you here in just a minute. Good morning, Andrea. A lot of times, people that I either get to introduce, get introduced to by other people, such as you all, um, I know you all, what is with this other thing today? But somebody will say, oh, you need to follow this person. You need to talk to this person. You'll really like listening in to, or learning from this person. Some of them are people that I'm being coached or mentored or personally following. Some of them are simply by hap or happenstance. And what's interesting is when we have like a little pre-call and get an idea. Good morning, Dave. Your friend Bethany is here. Um, we have a pre-call. I get to really dive in and learn a little bit more about them and their story. And often in the middle of it, that's where the title comes from. And in this case, starting a dream over in the middle was something that I kept hearing over and over again in Bethany's story as she was telling me about the experiences that she's currently in the middle of. So good morning, um, Barbara, and good morning, Marie. And so I think it's really important because often we think we start off on a dream, we pack our little backpacks, you know, we get our little sandwiches and our thermos is full and off we go. And it's just gonna be all hunky-dory and perfect and it's gonna work out the way we plan. And when we start to see detours, we either turn back, give up, or say this isn't what was supposed to happen and we sit down in the middle of it and cry. And Bethany is here to talk to us about that, starting a dream over in the middle. So good morning, Sylvia, good to have you as well. I am, whoop, I'm hitting the wrong button. So I'm gonna go find Bethany. You guys do, good morning. Nellie, good to talk to you yesterday as well. I'm gonna go grab Bethany and she should be uh, coming on in just a second. There we go. Um, take a moment, share this, like this, put this out there where other people can hear the story, not for me, but for Bethany and as well as for the person that's gonna receive this story. Good morning. Good morning, Cindy. Good morning, Bethany. Look at you all glam Good morning. Squad. You look fabulous for this morning, living out there in Wisconsin land at 8 a.m. I'll let you get settled in. But go ahead and share this out because somebody is in the middle of a dream and they feel like they, they, they're stuck. This, this is going to help them get unstuck. You all good? I think so. I'm having a little bit of internet connectivity issues this morning. My husband slash IT guy is working on it. So. <laughs> so either in the middle of it, so let's just go ahead and set it up. So if she freezes or if she has a delay, we'll just kind of keep talking until her husband climbs her back up on the See, You guys live out there in the rural Wisconsin. So he's sitting up like on the old green acres day where you had to climb up on the pole and answer the phone. You're probably too young to remember that TV show. Anyhow, for those old people, we're all laughing. For you young people, you're giving us that <laughs> look like, what are they talking about? So go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody. Tell them what they need to know about who you are besides being an amazing person. Oh boy. Um, wow. Well, I think if I had to sum up my, uh, my mission or my purpose, it would be to let people know that they matter, that they value, that everyone matters. There's a mentor of mine that says, what matters, everything, who matters, everyone. And uh, I spent a lot of years feeling like I didn't matter. And um, that caused me to play really, really small and to think really small and to dream really small if I dreamt at all. And I don't want that for anybody else. I, I got a life coach and I grew and I, I pushed through all the stuff in my head that was holding me back. And I don't have it all figured out by any means, but boy, our lives have changed. My life changed, my family's life changed. And, um, you know, through this internal work, right, your external life, changes and one thing that we've done is a little over a year ago we sold what was once our dream house a house that we had planned for oh my goodness almost a decade we had so many drawings of it and literally my husband drew it out on graph paper and that's how we built it 
and it was amazing and it was like what we thought was everything that we wanted and then we got it and we're like what if this isn't what it is so there was that dream and there we were starting in the middle because that thing that we thought was the dream wasn't really the dream or the dream changed because our awareness changed right so so about a year ago we uh we sold the house and we really sold most of our belongings like i have a bedroom set and two small little side tables and that's all i <laughs> have left of the college. furniture <laughs> and and <laughs> and we bought a motorhome and we had never camped before we weren't like the weekend warrior kind of camper people um, and, but we bought a, a class A motorhome, and we, uh, we lived in that for about a year. So we traveled the U S with our kids. We pulled our kids out of their public school where they had tons of friends and were really involved and were definitely seated there because that's all they ever knew. And, um, we traveled and we lived in 300 square feet. So at the time our kids were 12 and 14, they're now 13 and 15, but, um, 300 square feet, traveled mainly the west side of the U.S. and um, with the intention of being more connected to each other, being more connected to God, and um, so we're getting a stutter. Don't panic, everybody. Her husband is readjusting the Wi-Fi. You back? back through or back on one of the things I want to recap that she said she'll be back don't worry folks is that she had a dream they built the dream and then they evaluated whether the dream really fit if it was really who they were supposed to be or if it was really somebody else's idea and vision and they were willing to adapt and adjust I love how she said that the internal began to change the external so often we think it's going to work the out the other way around that we're going to change the external and then make the internal somehow change like if i change my job change my house you're fine i'm recapping the the information you okay. had about um internal versus external and how we think if we change our job change the house change our outfit change our hair change something externally somehow magically the internal is going to change and it doesn't work that way it, right. I mean, it might work that way for a weekend, for a month, for a year. But as my mother used to always say, no matter where you go, you're there. Yeah, and you I are. looked at her like, that makes no sense, mom. And it wasn't until I understood that she meant like the me, me is there, not just the physical me. Right. So um, I feel like I was rambling anyway. That may have been a perfect time for the <laughs> that internet. That may have been your allowed. husband going, here, let me right. <laughs> Stop talking. Um, no, your words. I, I think so, what was showing through was your 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 passion about what has happened in the last year. And I want to explain because everybody's probably looking like, is she in like an RV again? Did she get kicked out? <laughs> so part of this whole idea of starting a dream over in the middle, she is in her car. She was worried about it not looking professional. I thought it was most appropriate for what's happening in life. <laughs> She argued with me. I won always. Um, and so you, you sold the, the house, you got in the motor home, you actually had a vision of where you were going to live and where you were going to work and like, okay, this is it. We're going to do a couple States. Then we'll go down here. We'll look for a property in Florida. I'll take on this career. Our life is going to be golden. You had a dinner date and all of a sudden it was like, Hmm, need to think this. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you know, I had this, this magical picture in my head of how things were going to go on this trip and, and the end that we would end up in a warmer climate. And <laughs> like, I knew specifically like the three cities I wanted to be in and this picture of how I was going to live and work when this was all over. And um, we're in. We're in Wisconsin. This is not a warmer climate. Like we started <laughs> off in Iowa and, and we're in Wisconsin. So um, instead of going south, you went north. I think you need to work right? on geography. 
Right. Yeah. So um, it's funny how things change. I, I had some, I had dinner with some friends when we were in Florida and they're amazing people. But after dinner, I just kind of reevaluated. Well, I don't even know how to explain it, except the more I grow and the more I become aware and the more I learn about who I am, the more I know to trust my gut. Like if something doesn't feel right for whatever reason, it doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it may not be for me. And for me, that's like God inside, you know, I need to listen to that. And so it just didn't feel right. And we looked for housing and we couldn't find anything that we loved. And the kids were like, meh about it. And, and, and so we didn't really talk about it at the time. But then as we were traveling and we spent the 4th of July in Wisconsin, every one of us fell in love up here. And then we were all like freaked out by it. Like, wait, this wasn't the picture in our head. So, so I want to kind of catch up for a minute because there's a big point. I always say gut is God's voice under tension. It's kind of like you're going one direction and your God's voice is going another and there's that tension. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're feeling. She didn't say, but we had this plan and it was all written out and according to my business plan and according to my dream book and according to my vision plan board, blah, blah, blah. We got to stay the course, even though it feels wrong, even though it looks wrong, even though everything inside of me is saying it's wrong, I've got to stay the course or everybody's going to say I'm a failure. She said, wait a minute, this, this, this isn't right. And I'm not going to go with what doesn't feel right. Intellectually, I can talk myself into it or out of it, but mm -hmm. internally, in that still quiet voice, it's saying no. And you were brave enough, courageous enough to voice that. How do you, so you got a bus full of people. I call it the bus. <laughs> You've got teenagers that have been riding around the country in 300 square feet. And not even, the hard part is their brother and sister. And so we know what kind of dynamics that sets up. Your husband is a mechanical engineer who does things on graph paper, like ordering takeout. Mm -hmm. um, and you sold, sold life. I mean, down to the fact that the pictures on the wall that you had grown accustomed to were sold at a garage sale thing. How did you have the courage to say, we might be making a mistake, stop? Mm. I think it it took some time. It wasn't like I I heard the voice and then I like shushed it for a while because I was scared and I was scared of what people thought. And then and then I remember my previous career I spent in senior living and um and I'm I'm a nurse by trade and so I have been on the bedside of people for years as they face the end of their life. I've held their hand as they've taken their last breath. I've had conversations with them as they received hard diagnoses. And um, what made me be courageous in this moment was knowing those conversations because nobody ever talked about the stuff or even the place they lived. They talked about the, the relationships and the meaning behind their life. And so God was steering me in a different direction, steering us in a different direction. And I didn't know the meaning, but I wanted to trust that. And I knew that I'd spent years chasing things and chasing my plan and was miserable. I, I chased my plan for, oh my goodness, years, like titles and money and and prestige and being the best and working the most hours and wearing my busy badge with pride and it didn't work well for me. And, and so I think the courage came from like hitting my head against the wall so many times. Um, I heard someone say once like God either, you know, uh, nudges you with a feather or he hits you with a two by four. Well, I'm a two by four kind of girl. Like it doesn't, I don't learn quickly. So um, I'd had a lot of two by four moments. And so now the feather maybe works a little better for me. So, so I, I want to go there because you're sort of back in another two by four moment, jokingly. <laughs> so you're sitting there on the bus. You guys are like, you know, driving around in circles emotionally, um, spiritually. And 
you raise your hand to go, honey, we need to talk. How first I would have been like, like, okay, I'm going to get tossed off the bus in the middle of nowhere and be left alone. How were you received when you said, I think we might need to rethink this? He said me too. So isn't that interesting that often the vibration that we're feeling when we share a dream with a family or with a spouse or a business partner, because we join that dream in the, in the same vibration, as Paul would say, when that vibration shifts, they feel it too. And somebody has got to have the courage to say, can we talk? Because it's when it's so interesting. I see that in our life here that often I'll be like, we're going, we're going. And then I'll feel the shift. And I'm like, and the longer I wait to have the conversation, the more tension builds up around everything else. Because we started this journey, you and your husband and your family started this journey with a common dream, a common vision. Everybody was on board when they packed up the house and jumped on the bus. Mm -hmm. And then when it shifted, everybody felt the shift, but nobody was willing to say something. Right. It took a while. Well, I didn't want to give up on the picture in my head for God's picture. Like, I, I don't want to get, I had this picture. I had this plan. I had like sent people videos telling them I wanted to work with them. I had written blog posts about it. I had like announced it to everyone that would listen. This is what we're doing and here's where we're going to live. And I'm so excited and here's our new life and it's magical and full of unicorns and rainbows. And like, it's never magical. Like, like your highlight reel may look great from the outside looking in, but <laughs> not everything is magical. Like life is not, um, and I don't want to be like Debbie Downer, like, oh, life is so hard. But I mean, it is it is what you make it. And life is full of challenges. I remember um, hearing John Maxwell speak once, and he was talking about how after he was done on stage, a man approached him and said, you know, I just don't get it. Like, how is your life so perfect? You just, you never talk about the rough spots or the problems or like, you just always seem to be happy and things are great. And you know, John responded to him, my life is full of problems and obstacles, just like everyone's is. I just choose not to give that power. I choose not to focus on that. And so seeing an obstacle as an opportunity, you know, I heard someone say once, the obstacle is the way. And I think there's so much truth to that. And, and so seeing the obstacle as the opportunity um, okay, God, this isn't the direction you want us to go. I'm going to be brave and say something to my husband and then magically find out he's okay with that. And the kids were okay with it too, which was even crazier. <laughs> so, so here we go. It's like, okay, so we're not going to be living on the beach in Florida. Let's just head to Wisconsin for a weekend and watch fireworks. And as you arrive in Wisconsin, everybody's like, this is where we need to be. How did you adapt to the big shift? Like, okay, <laughs> we're supposed to be in Florida. Now we're in Wisconsin. The bus has got to get back to Texas. If we come to Wisconsin, what do we, like there was a whole rebuilding of the plan. And unfortunately your husband didn't really have a kitchen table to sit down and graph paper it out. Right, um, that's funny. So we didn't know the plan and we still don't know the plan to be honest with you. So do we, uh, we 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 found property up here that we thought was it like it's the screensaver on my computer <laughs> i'd written out goals i'd written out focus points and put it as the screensaver because this is what we thought we were going to do when we came up here and so we had talked about buying the property and we just needed to do some more research and needed to sell the rv and things and um we we're, so everybody's on board. We sat down and had a family meeting. Everyone's on board and we make a plan to get up here. And then we get up here and we've been here. This is our third week. Well, three and a half weeks. And um, everything has fallen through. So I want to are... summarize because so here's the here's the vision. You guys get the vision because <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing only with you, not at you, just so you know. Uh-huh. So it's like we drive to Wisconsin, we pull into this piece of property, it's a lake view, 
My husband gets out of the car, starts sketching in his head what the house is going to look like. He built our last house. He can clearly see this new house on the land. Right. It's not as big as the old, but it fits everything we've learned about ourselves during our year adventure on the bus. We commit to it. We run back to Texas because we have stuff in storage in a car there and we can sell the RV. You unpack the RV, you put the for sale sign on the RV, you come back to Wisconsin near family and you walk out to the property and you discover you can't build your house on it. Right. So right. mind you, we're homeless for the second time in less than a year. Oh, hashtag winning. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Are you sure you want me as a guest on here? What is up? Um, yeah, so here we are. So now we are, um, as we dove into the to the specifics of the land, it's in a floodplain, which we knew. I mean, Tom knows enough about building to know these things. But what we didn't realize is all the hoops and the time it would take to jump through the hoops to get a traditional septic system put in. And I won't go into the details, but we you know, we just felt like we didn't have that time. And, and the kids so, didn't want to use buckets from Home Depot. Right, right. Like we had, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, we are in my mother-in-law's basement and um, it is an experience and she's gracious enough to have us, but you know, having someone in your house is not always easy. And she's also battling with two right, teenagers. Right. Right. And so we, we try to stay in the basement and we don't want to interrupt her life, but she's also battling cancer. And, and so that, you know, that's hard too. And then we're bringing all the germs into the house and we're here in this little tiny space. And now we don't see the way we don't know the way we don't understand the way. And I spent some time mad. Like if I'm being real about it, I, I was mad. Um, I had some pretty stern conversations with God. Like, I don't understand why you, why we would come here and I'm trying to follow you. And, and I gave up on this dream of this next step with, you know, working with some amazing people and um, the picture in my head and I'm here now, now what? Great. I'm sitting in my Jeep, like in order to have a private conversation. Oh, okay. You know, so I don't know. I don't know what's next. And, and I'm not mad anymore. I, I've accepted it. It's like the stages of grieving almost like when your dream dies in, in the middle or it changes and you, you, you don't expect it, it. It, yeah, there's some, there's some grieving that happens. So how do you, and I know you're still in process and that's what I think is really important. You guys listen in is there is going to be a moment when your dream shifts, when it takes on a different perspective, when, as I say, the vehicle that you're riding in to get to where you want to go changes. You know, you may start off on the bus and be on the boat, then in the car, as long as you're going in the direction that you thought you were going to go, good for you. Your original goal was to connect as a family, connect in yes. faith, and then learn to prioritize things that come into your life, both opportunities and physical resources. Is that still your driving force? Yeah, absolutely. But I feel like we have, we've done, we've done that. Like, it's interesting. When I uh, went, took the kids to orientation before they started school here, and especially for my daughter, Gwen, so she's a freshman, the the teachers over and over the theme anyway that I heard was you know they're teenagers they don't talk to you much sometimes you may just get a grunt out of them when you ask a question and you know we just want to be mindful of like where they're at with their mental health we're here to support them with their studies and so on and so forth which is great there's nothing wrong with that except my kids talk to me all the time about <laughs> hard stuff like my son is not sitting at a table at lunch with kids in his class because of well because he's standing on his values and and the only reason I know that is because we are connected we're connected and the only reason we're connected in this way is because we spent this last year on the road together in 300 square feet and we had to be we had to navigate each other when we were irritating each other when we were upset with each other when we couldn't 
walk by each other when somebody had to use the bathroom and somebody was in it? I think it was interesting because we talked about that and you thought it was just sort of part of your life. Like, yeah. And I'm like, you don't understand the lessons of, of everybody communicates, few people connect, and all of that that you have been wearing to go through on that street. I mean, you're sitting in your bed. Mom is like working away from you on her chair, and dad is in the bathroom. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that is not the typical teenager's life. Like, like right. most of them are somewhere in a dark corner with a headset and an iPad. Your kids right. have to learn not only to communicate, but how not to communicate sometimes. Like, this isn't a right. point that I have to fight about. Or this isn't a Like, I always get told, pick your battles. I imagine in 300 square feet, pick your battles was probably tattooed on everybody's day book. Absolutely. That, and also knowing that there was time in that that drive that I can find the right moment to talk about it. Life doesn't have to operate on urgency. Mm -hmm. And so now that you've moved into your mother, your parents' basement, sorry, uh, mother-in-law's basement, that makes the story mm -hmm. even richer. Mother-in-law's basement, 300, is it more than 300 square feet? It is. It is. Yeah. And so it's 450, you guys. Um, right. It's, it's luxury <laughs> living. Um, plus, they have an outdoor that doesn't move. And you're sitting there, and I imagine there are moments that you're like, okay, I'm done. I'm done with this faith walk. I'm done with this journey of trust. I'm done. Life works better when I get my pen and paper out, and I do it my way. So God, we'll catch up with each other around maybe Christmas or I'll see you at Easter, but I need to get this boat back in the water and get it on track. How do you hold back that personality or balance mm -hmm. that and provide as a mom that sense of everything's gonna be okay? Cause that's gotta be a huge responsibility to keep that temperature in the water of we're okay family. Yeah, well, and the kids feel it. I mean, they feel the, just unsettled and they see the disappointment and we, we talk about it. We talk about it openly, how we're feeling and the frustrations and, and the questions that we have and that, and that we don't always see the plan. And but, so this is a really big uh, test of faith. Like how big are we going to believe here? I feel like God is so, so it's interesting because you can assign meaning to any of this, but my husband's like, do you think this means we're not supposed to be here? And I'm like, no, there were too many signs and too many feelings that we should be here for us to turn and run. I think this is God saying, so you think you've grown your faith? <laughs> yeah, we're going to test that. Bring it. <laughs> And, and, you and uh, I have the and, same relationship with God. He's like that <laughs> annoying big brother that just likes to pick at us. I, 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 uh, I feel like this is just like a, an obstacle and a challenge that's taking us. Like there's a light at the end but, of the tunnel but, and there's a reason. I just don't know what that is. But yet. I think what's really cool to see is you wouldn't be able to navigate mom's basement had you not practiced in the the bus the fact mm, that mm -hmm. your kids had learned in that space how to have open and, and honest conversations with you and trust that they would be respected and honored and listened to now when the level of stress might be slightly higher they've already practiced that they've already learned that they've already you've already modeled that so now as the stress level rises, you don't have to teach them a new skill. You came into it with a new skill. And I think about what you're creating as future parents or your kids becoming future parents. They've learned that skill of communicating spouse to spouse, of having those honest conversations, about being allowed to say, this is how I'm feeling, honey. It may not look big, strong, husband-like, but this is what I'm feeling, or as your daughter would go through her life, being able to say, this is who I am, this is what I'm feeling, and I'm frightened. You have taught them such a lesson about communication 
and you're modeling it under the most extreme situations that it has to now become their default mechanism for when they approach life. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, I don't know that we ever get it all figured out, but um, I think they're more aware and they're better because of our, our, of the decisions that we've made and we're better. I'm more aware and I am more patient and I, So when you say you're more aware or more patient, and she does the deep breath, like, yeah, I did say that, didn't I? <laughs> now I'm being held accountable. To that. That's right, that's right. Do you feel like you're starting over in the middle or do you feel like you're just changing vehicles? Yeah, the dream is the same. I'm just changing vehicles. Does that you know? It, it is. It is a new start, though, too. Like I think both. Because originally the dream was to learn to communicate, connect, and set a priority for ourselves as a family and our faith. Mm -hmm. And in your conversation with me today, you've really echoed how that faith has been brought really centered stage. Mm -hmm. And so. Is your son, and I read the post this morning, and my heart broke, is everybody's, <sighs> I've had similar conversations. Um, and again, he's a boy, which makes it even worse, because girls just somehow naturally, I don't know. I always say it's easier for girls to have friends than boys. But he came to you with that. When I look at the rate of teen suicide, and teens harming themselves because they don't have that communication. They don't have that faith. They don't have that family unity. What you spent, that time you're spending in the basement gave him permission to have that conversation with you and essence possibly ch saved his life. Yeah, I guess I didn't think about it that way. I'm honored that he feels safe enough to talk to me about. And um, I'm honored that, that he knows that I won't judge or I can't even fix this. I don't even know how to fix this, but, um, but he knows who he is and, and he's standing on that. And I, I'm incredibly proud that He's choosing not to sit at a table where the talk isn't what he's in alignment with. And it's not that he's better than those other kids. It's just that he's uncomfortable in that space. And I'm proud of him for being uncomfortable in a space where they're talking about things that aren't <laughs> appropriate. The boys talk about when they're sitting at a right. table with other boys. Right. Yeah. I just... So I mean, there's a huge part of me that's proud, and then there's another part of me that is incredibly sad for him. He's had an amazing friend group his whole life. Like, he was the leader of his friend group. Teachers would pull him aside and say, stop goofing off, because when you do it, everybody else does it. And, and, and so going from that to just feeling like you're not accepted at all and you're made fun of and... And for, he doesn't even know why people are just mean. Well, remind um, me he's in Wisconsin and I'm from Minnesota. People in Wisconsin and Minnesota take a while to warm up to other people. But once they do, <laughs> you're all in. It's kind of like winter. It takes a little longer in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, okay. People in Wisconsin and Minnesota, they're, you know, they're friendly, but it takes them a while to, they don't have emotions is what we always say in Minnesota. We put them on ice. Um, what I, what, I, what I think is so remarkable when I read your son's story this morning and then I talked to you is had you not followed that gut back in Florida, would that a conversation occur today? Yeah, I don't know. And, and so often we get so focused on going by the agenda, following the plan, doing what we set out, and we ignore our gut and we lose opportunities that are bigger than what's on the playbook. 
that we get so caught up in following and being disciplined. And I'm all about accountability and habits and strategies and systems. But if we don't take a moment and dig into that gut feeling, we lose bigger opportunities, like having a conversation with your son. Mm -hmm. Oh, Barbara and Lee, you have like, like zillions of encouragement comments. So just kind of push those and glue them all over your your three your four hundred and fifty square feet of house, um, <laughs> right? And some are for your son, some are for you, some are for the family. But Barbara Lee says, um, and I know Allison could probably help you with this. Not like putting her on the spot, but you need to bring a global youth initiative to his school in October. Yeah. Well, and I've offered that. I, when I met with the teachers who have been amazing, by the way, the teachers and the faculty and the, all the staff at the school, they're amazing. We have been embraced and welcomed and they've been kind and it's been incredible. And, um, and so, you know, this is, and, and I'm, I'm not playing victim here. It's not like, oh, poor me. Like, I get it. Everybody deals with this at some point in their life everybody does but there's got to be a little bit and not to like project it if it isn't there but that mom guilt of like had we not sold the house had we not bought the book, oh had we not gone this direction none of this would happen it's all my fault i'm a horrible mom i think there's a flash of that yeah but then i speak truth like then i know i know i know better and i know that you know hurting people hurt people no matter where you're at and and he sees that because one of the first things he said was, I wonder what his home life is like. I wonder what his family is like, that he feels like he has to be so mean, that this kid has to say these horrible things. Like, I love that. I love that. When I was his age and kids said mean things to me, I internalized all of it and made it all about me That's... so it could prove that I wasn't enough. And, and he sees it for, for what it is. I love that. And that all happened because you made the decision to chase a dream and live bigger. To yeah. stop holding back your voice, your dreams, your desires. You said, no, enough is enough being little. I'm going to be big. Because when I show my kids that I can be big, it gives them permission to be big. And being big is sometimes being alone. Right. Right. That There was um, the, the post I put up early this morning, um, there was someone that commented on that to that effect. Like I'd rather him be sitting alone than, you know, like, yeah, it's sometimes, yeah. And that's hard and that's hard. And I'm going to have lunch with him today. So oh, I, I, Tom and I were up at like, okay, but get this. He, so Tom and I, I were up at like three o'clock. I would just freak. Sorry. <laughs> I asked him, okay. I asked him and I said, I said, do you want me to come have lunch with you today? And he's like, yeah. And I said, are you sure? I don't want to be, I don't want to embarrass you. I don't, I, I know it's probably, I'm not cool. You know, are you I don't cool? have all the like, but, um, and he's like, no, I'd much rather you be there with me than to sit another day alone this week, even though I know I'm making the choice. And, and I'm like, okay. So he's like, will you call the school? And food? I am. Yeah, um, I believe so. And I think I can even pull him out of the lunchroom and they'll put us in a little private oh, no. room. I see, mean, see, see me, me, sarcastic evil dad would show up with two pizzas and be like, I didn't know if you <laughs> wanted pepperoni or cheese. So I got both. <laughs> and I would slap them down in the middle of the table and I would open the covers and make sure the aroma filled the cafeteria. And then I would <laughs> be looking like we've got a couple extra pieces. Anybody want one? Hmm. I didn't you know, think about that angle. Oh, oh, please. I know how to work every day. Yeah. 13-year-old <laughs> boys, pizza, they'll break down and, and like that, like totally. Um, yeah. I, I would just, hey, it's a pizza party. It's the end of our third week at school. Honey, here, I brought you five pizzas. Have a good time. Because um, sometimes even 13-year-old awkward boys don't know how to start a conversation with a stranger. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that's part of it, too. I think these kids have been together in school for, for years, and they don't get new students very often. I mean, there's like 25 kids in the entire school grade. Like, this is a really, really small school. 
and I, I, and this, the, the one kid that kind of seems to have control or, or manipulates or has this power over these other kids, it, that force is strong and they're all afraid to not sit there. Cause I don't want to be the victim of him making fun of them because he's mean. Like, I mean, and it just takes one kid to shift and the whole room will follow. And that's what I'm hoping. And that's what I keep saying to Gavin. I'm like, start your own group then. There's only two tables. Okay, make a third. Start start your own group. And maybe someone will come over. And there'll be kids that'll pop over and say hi, but they don't stay because, because and, they're scared. And I get my son. He's only 10, but I'll, I'll ask him, like, who's that? And he's like, I don't know. I'm like, you sat and talked to him for 20 minutes. Yeah, I don't know his name. <laughs> okay. Like, they don't understand the whole make or you'll talk to his friend for like an hour. I'm like, so what were you guys talking about? Nothing. I'm like, oh, that's right. Boy communication, girl communication. Like they process different. So I, I've got a lot of um, pizza thumbs up. Like, yes, start your Aww. own. Tanya Lowe says, everybody says pizza. Be the cool mom. I tried to be the cool dad once and my son told me to keep trying. I said, oh, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be the obnoxious dad instead. Um, so yeah, I would be the cool mom that shows up with two kinds of pizza because you didn't know which you wanted for lunch today and you were in a hurry. And uh, with 25 kids, two pizzas, eh, somebody's going to come up short, but somebody's going to come up with a few slices. So so now that you're you're like, okay, we, we've gotten through the trauma of the disappointment of the land. We're beginning to look for new properties. We're beginning to sort of reset the course how do you keep and this was an experience we had when we came back from Uruguay how do you keep from expanding back into the old life I don't know I guess I'll tell you check back in like three months and I'll let you know but um I don't want the old life and, and I feel like I'm not even that person that was living that old life anymore. And our, and I don't, it's almost like when you grow in your awareness, it's hard to go backwards and, and like just magic, like fall because your habits have changed. You can't fall back into the old habits necessarily, at least without You choose intention. to go back, but you can't fall back. Yeah. So um, I could see like me having two cabinets full of hair products again, because that's that's like like a thing, a downfall. But I will not have a house that has empty rooms in it that we don't ever go into. I won't do that. And I and I and our what we want is small enough that we have to be connected, that we aren't all off in our corners and not even interacting with each other. We're we're finding a house of a small size for that reason. Because we realized we don't, we don't need all that. And it, for us, that does nothing but foster disconnection. And I have, I have five years left with the kids at home. Five years. That's five it. Five Christmases. Right. I, I want to be connected. I don't want to be distracted. I don't want to be stuck on social media. I don't want to be not intentional about my time with them. I, I, I'm honored that they even want me in their life. I remember when I was their age, I was so disconnected from my parents. I mean, we spend hours at night doing homework with them or just being supportive of homework. And I don't think we're helicopter parents, but like if they have questions, they ask us and we figure it out together. Everything's figure outable, you know, we, we figure it out. And, and they know that we're there to help write note cards or to quiz them on things. And, and, and they want that. And I feel so blessed that they are okay I, I with that. From I don't want to lose journey, it. <laughs> our journey in Uruguay, one of the things that I think our kids saw and that we each saw was that because it was so foreign to all of us, everybody was always in figure it out mode. Like, you know, as the parent, sometimes I can be in charge and know everything and go everywhere. But I'm in a country where I don't speak the language. I don't know the culture. I don't know anything about it. And so I'm figuring it out in the presence of my kids and them seeing that I don't have it all figured out. 
really allowed them to start making more mistakes because they didn't feel that huge perfection gap between us. And still now, my son will ask me, I'm like, honey, I don't know. This is the first time I'm doing this too. Like, I don't know the answer, but let's just go and figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I love that you're intentional about staying connected and about staying engaged. You know, when you said, I've got five years, I get it. Maybe they'll stick around for the sixth or the seventh. But I tell my son that the same thing. It's like, honey, when you're 18, you're going to go be able to go and have your own life. And you're going to have like maybe 60 years of doing it your way. So for the next five Christmases, you're doing it my way. And he'll like kick and scream and fight with me. But I'm sorry. I'm not giving up those days, those weeks, those moments, just because somebody tells me that my kid's got to be in soccer and a piano and in karate. Um, so yeah. I, I love what you're doing. I honor what you're doing. I so respect that you're willing to do the uncomfortable, the uncommon, the, the thing where people look and go, you know the size of house they have? You realize they've only got one car? They have to go, like all of those things that right. we as Westerners statusize I mean, your son sat down at a table with you and said, mom, I'm breaking, help me. And I know why I'm breaking and I'm okay with it, but I just want you to know it's hard. You get golden parent of the award, year award. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a huge, I mean, you know how many parents would trade everything, the 10 bedroom house and the four cars and the vacations at the beach to be able to know what their kids are thinking in their heart, what they're thinking. And you're in that moment right now and you're not letting it go because your faith is so strong that you know that God has placed you where you need to be placed, not for any professional reason, not for any prosperous reason, but for the heart of your children. You are fighting for the heart of your children every single day. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard. It's hard on you. It's hard on your husband. But you are showing up faithfully because you know there is a bigger plan. <clears throat> I've lived the other way. I, again, I alluded to it earlier, but I spent years... You know, I would come home uh, from work and I would see the kids and have supper and then they would go to bed at eight and I would turn around and go back to work until like 1 a.m. and then come back home and sleep until five and be back at work at 6 a.m. because I had to be the best and I was the best and I was promoted and people looked at me and thought I was superwoman, but I had no relationship and I had no connection with my kids and my my marriage was not what it is today because of that and I don't want to go back to that I've, I've wasted too much time and and again hearing people on their deathbeds they don't talk about the square footage of their house they don't talk about the Mercedes they don't talk about the money in their bank account they talk about the time wasted not talking to people because they were mad for years they talk about um, things they wish they would have done and chances they wish they would have taken. I, I just want to be used up, you know, like at the end of my life, when I meet God, I want him to be like, okay, I gave you this plate of gifts and, and you did pretty good. Instead of Bethany, I gave you all these gifts. I gave you all of this opportunity. What did you do with it? I don't want to squander this. We get one life. And, and for me, I want it to be big in the way that it is meant to be big for me. And I want that for everyone else, too. There's and, a way. And I love that you're living that out because your podcast is, I know it has the word big in it, but I forgot the order. Yeah. So, well, it's dialed in, but then I do a big life series where I talk with people that are living big. And, and it could be just um not just there isn't a just but it could be just being the best mom and wife you can be it could be volunteering it doesn't have to be a platform and a stage and uh, you know things like that a big life means something different for everybody and so you guys i love her podcast by the way and she's got some 
some fun people coming up. I talked to Allison too the other day. Um, <laughs> Allison's going to be on it for those that know. So two women from Wisconsin. It's going to sound a little <laughs> nasal for a while. Um, <laughs> it's a Wisconsin joke. But I believe that you are living like, like even if you had a 3,000 square foot home right now, what you and your husband are doing would echo off the walls and back to your kids. I know the challenge, having been through it similar but differently with traveling back to Uruguay and back and forth. My son and I have this joke. I'm like, have I told you yet today? And he's like, no, you're late. And I'll have to say, I love you. Or he'll say, yes, but don't do it twice. Like, I make sure that he knows every single day that I made the intentional action of telling him I love him and what I love about him. There are so many moments as parents that we just assume we've got tomorrow, next week, the next time. We don't, we, we, we don't realize that who we're creating is gonna go out there in the world someday without us and that we have such a limited time and space to make them the best beings that they can. And you and your husband have sacrificed everything for that vision of faith, to raise faith-filled children, to raise children of compassion and caring and understanding and awareness that if, I know it doesn't sound very encouraging, but if you have to go to the family car to get a few minutes of peace and quiet, <laughs> <laughs> and have your mom copy and read your glamour magazines or whatever. <laughs> know that someday you may not see the reward today, but you will know when your son is, you know, that, that fifth generation. John Maxwell wrote the book, Five Levels of Leadership. I always think that there's this fifth level of parenting where you're the grandparents and you're watching your, par your kids parent the grandchildren and you see those lessons, those legacy lessons of communication and commitment and faith being passed down, you're building fifth generation, your fifth level parenting right now. Yeah, I hope so. I'm trying. Trying. So <laughs> the journey has only taken a shift. We've sold the, the, the mini, the bus. We bought the land. We didn't buy the land. We're now scouting for a new home, but throughout the middle, you have made a commitment to continue to grow your business, which is coaching and speaking and inspiring mm -hmm. and mentoring about that idea about living a big life. Right. Three steps to get started on living a big life. And I know we didn't rehearse this. So now you're going to be like, Whew. <laughs> well, all right. First of all, know that you're worthy. Yeah, I like know that, that it's, it's not for everybody. It's not just for the certain kind of people somewhere. It's for everybody. So knowing that you're worthy. Um, and I don't think that you can live a big life unless you know who you are. So diving into what your are Because that's what you trade your, your life for. And uh, taking some time to think about um, the things that you're passionate about. So oftentimes our greatest pain is where our biggest passions come from, right? So, um, and, and doing one thing, small steps, small hinges swing big doors, right? So uh, those small steps every day, just consistent steps. And it could just be one thing. You don't have to know the whole plan. Goodness knows. I have no <laughs> idea what the plan is here, people. Like you just, you keep taking steps in the direction of the dream and, and the vision that God's put in your heart and, and things will fall into place and it just requires a lot of faith you know and, and and it's okay you can do it i think that was like eight steps sorry i'm not good at you know sticking to three things so i'm gonna sort of work so um know that you are worthy and you know i mm -hmm. love that you guys know who you are and then take a small step small small hinges swing big doors now i'm packing the who you are that's a little bit that's a, that's a tough one for some of us. Mm -hmm. And as you said, sometimes the obstacles are really the opportunities for us to figure out who we are. If those obstacles keep showing up in your life, it's probably the one thing that you haven't unpacked that you've been afraid to. And so take time to really unpack that, um, to go ahead and give yourself permission to figure out who you are. 
so often we get consumed in letting other people label us and identify us and tell us who we are. And then we lo get lost in the process and we buy into other people's dreams and we buy into other people's journeys and we get halfway down and we find ourselves lost in those things that are important to us lost. So I think number two yeah. is like more than a big, a little step, but it's the most important. Well, I'm sorry. Number one is the most important. Yeah. It's you got it. Yeah. There is nobody on the earth that has more than you have, except those people who are achieving it have accepted that they're worthy of the right to achieve it, that they, they've believed long enough to say, you know what? I am worthy of more than what's currently happening in my life. Now, I don't know how mm -hmm. it's gonna turn out. I don't know where it's gonna go, but I know that I was not created to live below the line, that I was created to live breaking through the line. Absolutely, you know, as, as I'm listening to you recap, um, there's there's something that I did in, in towards the beginning of my personal growth journey that really offered me clarity because sometimes it's hard to know um, who you are or, or sit down and say, well, I'm great at this or I'm great at that or whatever. It's easier to maybe know who you aren't or what you don't <laughs> want to be doing. And, but that's a good starting point too. And um, I, I went through this exercise where I did a time study for three days. So 15 minute increments, I wrote down how I was spending my time. And then I, uh, I also wrote down what my priorities were and I, um, categorize them, you know, one being the most important, right? One to 10. And then I uh, broke down my time into segments of the percentage of my life I was spending doing those things. And when I compared it to my priorities, I realized that's probably why I was not right. Yeah. I said my family was important, but I spent, you know, 70% of my time at work. Huh? Maybe that's why I'm not connected. And um, I actually just sat down in the last few days and put that entire exercise and some bonuses together. And it, I have it um, to send out for just to, to help people grow. So it's free and it's on my website and, um, and you can get access to it and I'll send it to your, to your email. If you sign up for it, it's um, on the big life page. So it's bethanyclim.com forward slash big life. And uh, if you go there, I, I'll send you that, that resource. I, as I was thinking about things that really helped me push through, that really helped me prioritize my life, that was one simple step. And in just a few days, you'll have so much clarity. So if you don't know where to start, you have an option right in front of you. Um, the action brings clarity. So, so do something. So you've forward. got like a thousand happy faces and thumbs up and hearts. <laughs> Marie says the 15, the 15, time, 15 minute time study is amazing. I love doing that because as you said, we say on our vision board, we say in our goals, we say in our journals, we say in our prayers, what we think are, what our priorities are or what we want. But when we look at the actions of our day, we're like, wait a minute. No wonder I go to bed exhausted because I've been doing everything except what brings right. me purpose and passion. No wonder I feel like I don't want to get up in the morning or go into the office or do the things that I want to do. And what else adds to the 15 minute study is when you go through it and you see it, sometimes there are actions that you don't see the parallel that if you just create the parallel between the priority and the action and you make it clear, like, you know, as you said, my family is a priority, but I'm spending all my time at the office. Okay, but when you get home, are you leaving the office at the office? Or is right now being at the office critical for your family's success and survival so that you can, like, not everything is gonna be a clear direct, but mm -hmm. if you're lacking passion in your job, then maybe you need to look at how it's feeding your priorities and vice versa, but all of that is right. explained. Um, I think Elizabeth got the website. Let me just double check. Because Elizabeth is amazing, by the way. She can type fast. Yes. I can speak and I speak really quick. Um, <laughs> she is amazing. She got it. So you guys check it out. Thank now you, I'm Elizabeth. Copy it above. I love that gift. Thank you for bringing that gift. My pleasure. Yes. I, I, I know it's tough right now. I know that there are many parts of the day where you just want to sit in the car by yourself and just breathe. 
But I tell you, I, I could probably dial a dozen parents that would trade everything right now for what you had with your son. Hmm. So slow down, see what's happening for, like see what's really happening. I know you feel like you've got to rush into a house and reestablish and put down the stakes and all of that. But as we talked about a couple of months ago when you were still on the bus, there's a lot of things happening that are just happening that I think sometimes we often take for granted because they're part of our everyday life that other people would be amazed to see happen. I mean, you're sitting in the middle of traffic with teenagers and husband and you're trying to communicate without losing a temper. That's, that's a skill many families need <laughs> and you mastered it. You know, having oh. a teenage daughter in a one bathroom 300 square foot, I mean, a teenage daughter. I mean, I, right. I remember my sisters would cover the entire countertop with hair products and curling irons and straighteners and blow dryers and all of that. I can't imagine navigating that space with a teenage daughter. So well done, mom and dad, because I know he's still up on the pole holding the Wi-Fi signal. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> So again, give the website for the 15-minute uh, exercise. Can you give it us? It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's Bethany Clem, B-E-T-H-A-N-Y-C-L-E-M.com, and then uh, forward slash big life. All right. Um, we got that. And again, are you doing the pizza? I might do the pizza. I'm So I'm processing that i'm a little nervous about like my husband is even more nervous about embarrassing gavin but um yeah i i like the pizza idea the more i think about it so i may do it alone i don't know if tom will go with me but i know gavin would would probably like it if tom went too so we'll see we'll see what happens <laughs> well and again you guys <laughs> take a moment and just really connect with bethany on this journey i know she's going to get back into her blogging and her podcasting and exploring the journey as they go. I can't wait to see where you guys end up next. I have this feeling you're just going to buy a hot air balloon and just float above the crowds <laughs> and just drop in places and go exploring like yeah. the movie Big. But I got to tell right. you, from my heart, I so admire what you're doing. I, mm. I, I mean, you, the conversations you're having with your kids are creating generational impacts like legacy moments that will echo throughout time. And you're willing to pay that, that, that pain price right now to hold on to those moments for as long as you can. So well done, well done. I know it's not easy. I know it's exhausting. I know it's filled with fear. I just, I, as an outsider, I want you to know and I'm sure there's a couple other people that will agree with me that you are doing an amazing job of doing what's most important, and that's connecting with your kids. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to connect with um, whoever is out there that has any, anything else to add, or if I can help you in any way, if you need to know how to con start conversations with kids or how to break through the barriers. If there's anything I can do, I would be happy. I'm not an expert here. I'm just learning this as I go, just like everybody is. It's just a journey. So, um, wow. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for having me today. No worries. And it's funny, somebody just said, you don't have to be an expert. You just have to be authentic. And I think that's <laughs> exactly who you are, honest and authentic and faith-filled. And anybody can learn from you. So I appreciate you coming and being my guest even if it means you had to do it from the studio, or I'm sorry, the remote studio. <laughs> right, the remote studio. <laughs> Thank you so much for jumping in. I can't wait to hear how the rest of the day goes. Please at least let me know or let all of us know um, through your Facebook page. You guys, again, this is why I love Fun Friend Friday. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what we're going to learn and share it together. But we always have such amazing guests that show up that are authentic and caring and wanting to give the best. So take a moment, and like we learned last week with Bill, don't just share it out, but tell people why you feel there's value in seeing it, watching it, learning from it, because there's probably a parent struggling very similar to what 
is going on in Bethany's home. There's probably a family trying to figure out how to make that connection or those big moments into their family and into their lives. And this is a path towards it or somebody that just wants to figure out how to get their priorities straight and having that 15 minute exercise could be what finally gets them on the track to creating a life that they fall in love with again. So don't be selfish, take a moment and share it out. And uh, again, thank you so much for being my guest today. I appreciate you with all my heart. Everybody else, go out and live your life with success. Because like Bethany told me, step one is going to Bye-bye, everybody.